Okay, if you open your Bibles, we're going to be at the last chapter of Matthew. We're going to read the last thing Jesus said to his disciples. So he has died, risen again, and he's giving them directions. We're in Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And I heard that my wife um, who gave the message last week, did a good job. She's trying to take my job, I guess. But, <laughs> um, but before that, we were talking about God's promises. What are God's promises to us, and how can we depend on those? And so Jesus here has just made a promise to his disciples. He said, I will always be with you. Isn't that what he said? So he said he'll always be with us. But what is he doing right now? Have you ever thought about that? What is Jesus doing now? We know he came to earth, he came to die, to be raised again, and then he gave these directions to disciples. What is he doing now? Well, that's what we want to look at this morning. And we have to go back to the beginning. At the very beginning, what happened? And at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, God had made creation. It says it was good. He made everything. His last creation was man. He said that was very good, right? And God and man in creation were in perfect relationship to one another. God was God, and man worshipped God as he should. And there was nothing impeding their relationship. And the earth, the world, the universe was in perfect harmony with God's plan. The, the uh, man was given the job and the wife to tend the garden, the Garden of Eden. But there was no weeds, there was no thorns, there was no, it was a joy to work it. Everything was in right relationship. But then God did a very dangerous thing, which we've talked about before. He let man choose whether or not to stay in right relationship with God. And Adam and Eve blew it, and they chose not to. And since then, everything has been out of whack. It's kind of like a train on a track, right? When a train is on a track, it, it functions as it should. It can go places. It does what it's meant to do. But if a train gets off track, it's very bad. Nothing good happens when a train gets off its track. In order for us who are made to relate rightly to God, we will never function as we should unless we are connected to God in the right way. And, and Joe talked about it in his communion message this morning. Thomas Merton, uh, a Christian thinker, said that the reason we're in conflict with other people is because we're in conflict with ourselves. And the reason we're in conflict with ourselves is because we're in conflict with God. We're not at peace with God. Nothing can be right until we're at peace with God. And so from the very beginning, from the very moment that Adam and Eve screwed things up, God has been working to put them back again. God's goal, his objective, the thing he is working on is to restore those relationships. He's going to put them back. And it's interesting, I think, that God knew before he made everything, what Adam and Eve would do. He knew the pain it would cause. He knew the price he would have to pay to set it right. And he still did it. He thought it was worth it. He knew all this stuff that would happen, and he decided it was still worth it to make us. And so now God, everything God does, is working to restore creation as it should be. That's what God's doing. Now for us... That's hard to understand because Jesus died 2,000 years ago. And the Bible says God's work of restoration was finished at the cross. Jesus said, it is finished. My work of restoring people to God, to me, is done. And yet 2,000 years later, we don't see the effects. Not, not entirely, right? There's still things that are out of whack out there. I think one thing that may help us understand this is I work with new teachers, and one of the teachers who was applying for our program, she had to get her health clearance. So she went to her doctor 
to get evidence that she had gotten all these immunizations. And the doctor didn't keep very good records. She had gotten them, but he didn't have it. So he had to find it. And that delayed her ability to apply for the program. And so there's this red flag on her name, on her application, until finally she got what she needed and she submitted it to UH so she could get in. However, the office she submitted it to did not take that red flag off of her, her name. So our program sees she did not fulfill this requirement. She's on the verge of being kicked out. She did what she was supposed to do, but the effects of it had not taken place yet. Jesus did what he had to do to restore us to God. The full effects of that have not taken place yet. Not yet, but God says they will. They are going to be. God is going to restore everything. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Now, we see that Jesus, this restoration of God to us, is Jesus is the embodiment of that. Because Jesus is God. He is 100% fully God. And yet he's 100% fully human. He's a unique being. He didn't just take on the appearance of a human being. He did that in the past. He actually became a human being. And so you have God and humanity existing in the same person. So Jesus is the embodiment he is the bridge between us and God, right? In him dwells both God and man. And so he's our, our bridge back to God. Now, so what is Jesus doing to restore us to God right now? And, and th Jesus is never doing nothing. I don't know if you ever find yourself with nothing to do, wasting time just digging your toenails or whatever you're doing, the toe jam, <laughs> whatever. That's a waste of time. Jesus is never doing nothing. He always has something to do. It may not seem like it to us, but, but he does. So Jesus is he's restoring us to God in three ways. He has taken on three roles since he returned to heaven. So he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Who has the authority? The leader, the ruler. Whoever wins the war, if there's a war then the guy who wins has the authority, right? The golden rule. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. Where if you win, you get to make the rules. And Jesus won because there was a battle. There was a conflict. And the, the conflict is over sin and death. Sin is what separated us from God, right? We chose to rebel against God. Jesus was the first human being who never sinned. Never sinned once. Jesus was the first and only. Jesus was the first human being, not who died, they all died, and he wasn't the first one who came back to life, but he was the first one who died and by his own power came back to life. So there was people who died before. Lazarus, Jesus brought him back to life. Jesus brought him back to life. Lazarus didn't do it himself. Jesus is the only one who died, the only human who died, and by his own power raised himself back to life. Jesus conquered death. Death could not hold him. He was stronger than death because he didn't sin. Those are the two things that, that separate us from God. Those are the two things that we battle with. And Jesus conquered them both. And because of that, he has all authority. God said, I put all things under his feet. Right? Now, he's not literally got his feet on us. It means that he's the ruler. He's in charge. He's the one in control. Jesus is. So... Um, when it says that Jesus ascended, because that's what it says, Jesus ascended into heaven. And ascended means to go up. But it just didn't mean that he physically went up. It means that he took a higher position, like a king who gets, um, ascends to the throne. It has a higher meaning. Jesus took a higher position. And we see that in, in John. So Jesus has risen from the dead. The first person to go to that tomb was a woman. Now, God's a feminist. I just want you to know God is for equal rights. Because in that culture, you would never say that a woman went there first. You wouldn't do it because women were second-class citizens. To, to say a woman went there first is to undermine your testimony, right? Their testimony was not valid in court. But God says, well, first of all, it's true, right? But that's how we know it's true. Because if they made up the story, it would never be a woman. 
But Mary goes, she wants to see Jesus. The tomb is empty. She's upset. And Jesus appears to Mary, and this is what he says to her in John 20. He says, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending, ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, why did Jesus say, don't cling to me? Well, she saw Jesus. This is her teacher, her master, who she thought was dead. It was a natural inclination to want to grab him and hold on to him in joy. And he said, don't do that. Not because he didn't want to be hugged by her, but he wanted her to understand he wasn't going to stay here. He had to go back to heaven. And he had to do that because while he was here in physical form, he was limited. If you wanted to hear Jesus speak, you had to go to where he was. You're not going to hear him otherwise. You might hear about him. But if you wanted to hear Jesus, if you wanted to encounter him, if you wanted to interact with him, you had to physically go to where he was. But when he ascended, that changed. He could be anywhere at any time. Right? And we see this embodied in the nation of Israel before Jesus came. And did we did. The nation of Israel, God said, you're going to be my people. You're going to show the whole world what it means to have relationship with me. I'm going to show that through you. You, you and I, this nation, we're going to have a relationship. And you're going to bless the whole world. And he said, you're going to go and occupy this piece of land. And you're going to stay there. And in that, the way we interact... You're going to be the light to the world. And there was a temple. And in that uh, special place that almost nobody got to go to, God's presence dwelt. God dwelt there. But what did Jesus say to his disciples at the end just now? He didn't say stay here anymore. He said go. He said go into the whole world before Israel is to stay here and occupy the land to be a light of the world. Now Jesus says you are to go because wherever you go, I go. Jesus lived in the temple in the Old Testament in the, the nation of Israel. He's got a new temple now. You and I are his temple. He dwells in our heart. And so where we go, God goes. God said go. Because wherever you go, the kingdom of God goes. Where you go, I'm going. And I want you to take it to the whole world. So Jesus ascended and has become greater because now he can be anywhere at any time. And uh, Tim Keller, I know I quote him a lot, but if you're gonna, every pastor steals from other pastors. If you're gonna steal, steal from the best. And to me, he's the best. And so he said, this is what Jesus is saying to Mary. Rather, you want to put your hand in my hand, but if you let me go, I can put my heart in your heart. It'll be better. You, you'll take me with you everywhere you, you can't lose me. I'll be inside of you. So Jesus is taking on a greater role as the king. Now kings act on behalf of their subjects. They use their power for the good of the people. And, and I don't know if you knew, when we wanted to start this church, we had encountered a conflict um, that made it difficult for us to do that. But there was somebody with greater authority, greater power, who... Um, came and worked on our behalf. They used their authority to enable us to, do, to start this church. They used that authority for our good. And that's what God's doing. He's using his power. Jesus is using his power for our good. Now it seems like, like I said, it seems like Jesus is doing nothing. He's never doing nothing. But it seems that way to us. But there's so many things that go on behind the scenes. So the experience of most people who went to the men's retreat they went there, everything is set up, the food is all provided, right? They don't need to do anything. The program is set, the speakers are arranged, they get to experience the retreat. But somebody, mostly Robert, but other people, had to do a lot of stuff that they didn't see in order for that to happen, right? That's true of any event, any organization. It's true of this church. People come in and set up, so when you come in, it's ready to go. So Jesus is doing a bunch of stuff behind the scenes that we don't know, that we don't understand for our good. We may not see it, but it's happening. Jesus is working on our behalf. Amen. And, 
And the last thing Jesus is doing is the king, is the person with all the power. We talked about a couple weeks ago. He said that everything that happens to you is going to work for your good. Even the bad stuff. God may not intend the bad stuff, but he's the guy with all the power. And he can turn bad things into good things. And so if you've been blessed at, at all from this church, a big cause of it starting was a failure, a business failure. And it was my business. I had a small business in town. Um, I sold comic books and baseball cards, which makes you wonder why it failed, right? Because everybody wants those things, right? But it did fail. I couldn't support my family with it. And I think God honestly did that because um, I wasn't meant to be there. And so I had to do something else. I, I have to do whatever it takes to support my family. This wasn't doing it. One day, I just happened to read the paper. And in it is an article about the state is paying for people to get special education degrees. It doesn't say how to contact them. It doesn't say anything about this. It says the state is doing that. I took that as that's it. That's what God is telling me. That's how I'll support my family. I had to scramble. I had to call UH and find out who do I submit my application, all that I had to do. And I had three days to do it, and I got it in. And I became a teacher, and I did that for 10 years. And, and uh, as I went to UH, um, when I became a teacher, I would take student teachers from the program I was in, which kept me in relationship with them until finally there was a position opened where I could become a mentor to these teachers in our program. I could change my position. I was no longer a teacher. We have teachers in here right now. It's a very demanding job. Just so you know, it's demanding. You think they get like three months off or whatever over the course. They put 12 months worth of work in the nine months that they're in school easily. And if I still had that job teaching, we couldn't have started this church. But I got that other job which gave us the flexibility, me the flexibility to do that. So it really, God takes bad things and turns them good. We have a church today because my business failed. That's not a good thing, right? And I'm sure you can look at your life. Things that have happened that seem bad, but God could use them and turn them and use them in a good way. Amen? Okay, so God is the king. God is also the prophet. Jesus is a prophet. Prophets provide for their people. Moses was the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. If you remember, he called the people out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. They weren't meant to be there long, but they complained. They griped. But they had to eat, so God provided food through Moses. He gave them bread. Bread came down from heaven every morning that they gathered and can eat that day. They were in the desert. They were thirsty. God told Moses, whack this rock and water will come out. He provided for them. Jesus, one time, he was out in the wilderness. He was teaching over 5,000 people. They think it was like 20,000. They were hungry. He provided them food. You know what they said after that? Some people said, because Moses predicted there'll be somebody like me. God will raise up somebody like me. And the people were looking for that. So he provided them bread in the desert. When Jesus did that, people said, hey, this must be the prophet. This must be the guy that Moses was talking about. A chapter later, Jesus is in the temple telling the people, hey, if anybody's thirsty, come to me. I'll give you water. You'll never be thirsty again. You know what people said? They said, that must be the prophet. That must be the prophet that Moses was talking about. And Jesus does provide for us. He does. Uh, he, a prophet speaks for God, and Jesus is speaking to us through two main ways. When we pray, he speaks back to us. Prayer is not one way. It's not us talking to God. It's a conversation. And Jesus wants to speak to us, and he will speak to us if we let him. And the other way is this, right? The, the fact that this book even exists is a miracle. But this is what God has to say to us. Now, it's not a magic book. It's not as though anybody, it's not, remember in Indiana Jones, the first movie, the Nazis wanted that, um, the Ark of the Covenant, because, and the thinking was, anybody who has it won't lose. Because when the Israelites had it, they didn't lose. Well, it's not magic. And this book is not magic. It's not as though whoever reads it gets this magical insight. God has to reveal it to us. God says, don't cast your pearls before swine. 
And if he's telling us to do it, he won't do it either. He's not going to give godly insight to people are going to throw it away or trample on it or waste it. But people are submitted to him and say, God, please help me show you what you want me to know. God will reveal the truth through this book to us if we take the time. We need Jesus to understand it. And he will do that as our prophet. The last thing Jesus does, so he's, he's king, he's prophet, but he's also the priest. And a priest in the Old Testament would sacrifice animals on behalf of the sins of the people. Right? That's what a priest did. And in Romans 8, it says this. It says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who is interceding for us. So in the Old Testament, that priest's job was to sacrifice the animals on behalf of the people. Jesus is a better priest. He sacrificed himself. He was the sacrifice on our behalf. Now that should give us great comfort. At the retreat, I shared a little bit uh, with the man about my store. And I think I've shared with you before, but there was a catalog every month filled with awesome stuff. I mean, you could spend hours looking through that. I'm sure I did, <laughs> right? There was so much stuff in that catalog every month that I could order. I can't order it all. It's impossible, right? So I would make the catalog available. People could look through it. If they wanted to order something, I would do it. And people would do that first. Expensive items, they would, they would order, ask for. I would order it for them. But I quickly learned, because it takes like two months for the item to come in, people who ordered stuff didn't always come in, especially if it was expensive. And so I learned the hard way. I needed, they needed to put some money down. Yes, I will order that for you. Yes, I'll give you a discount. But you need to put down a deposit. And you're not going to get it back. So if you don't come in, I keep the deposit. And almost nobody didn't not come in after that, right? They always came in virtually, right? And so when you're invested in something, when you put something valuable into something, you don't give it up easily, right? And Jesus put him his whole self. He sacrificed himself so that we could be with him. He's not going to throw that away. He's not going to give up on us easily. He won't give up on us at all. When Jesus said, I I'll be with you always, there was two meanings to that. Literally, he would be with us. He dwells inside of us. But he's also saying, I'm not going to give up. I will never let you go. The only way we separate from God is by our own choice. Never will God let us go. Never. We should find great comfort in that because you and I are going to screw up today. Somehow, in some way, we're going to fall short. I, I, sorry to tell you that. I, I, don't, I, I don't believe we have to. I think when you become a Christian, and I believe the Bible teaches you, that we are free from the power of sin. We don't have to sin anymore. His power over us is broken, but we do sin. We still do. And God doesn't say, that's the end. I'm through with you. I've had enough. God doesn't say that. He does say that to some people who persistently and consistently say, God, I want nothing to do with you. And what more can God do than to let them go? But he doesn't want to, and he'll never choose to do that. He's invested all he has into restoring us to him. That should give us great encouragement. God loves us. He will not give up on us. Now a priest prays over and protects his people. And so how does Jesus do that? It says that Jesus intercedes for us um, in that scripture we just read. So if you really wanted to protect your child, right? We all do. We have our children. We love our children. We want to protect our children. And you can't. You can't entirely unless you lock them in a room for their whole life and they're never exposed to any danger of any kind. You could do that, I guess. You would warp your child horrifically, right? It wouldn't be good for them, but we would protect them. 
And Jesus, we're in the world. We must interact with the world. Jesus can't protect us from everything. He gave us free will. We are free agents acting in this world. We are his agents. We are to do his work. And so he can't protect us from everything. But what he can do is pray for us. Remember the night he died. Peter said, man, I, will, I would die for you, Jesus. Nobody, nobody could keep me from being faithful to you. And, and Jesus said, well, you're going you're gonna to deny me. And he said, look, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan wants to get his hands on you. Jesus didn't say, I prayed that that wouldn't happen. Jesus said, I prayed that you would come through it okay. I pray that in the end, you'll survive it. And that's what Jesus does for us too. He doesn't pray to keep us from every danger, but he does pray that our faith will be strong enough. We'll grow through it. He's praying for us. And prayer, what did Jesus say? He said, look, if you pray anything according to my will, it's going to happen. Now, Jesus never prays anything contrary to God's will, right? He is God. So if he's praying for our blessing, praying for our protection, that will happen. It will be provided. Jesus is praying for us. So we're okay. In John 14, 18, Jesus said this, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. All that belongs to Jesus belongs to us. In him and through him, we are conquerors. We are more than conquerors, right? That's what he says. And so Jesus is not doing nothing right now. He's actively working to restore us and the whole world to God. And so that should give us great, great comfort. Amen? Well, let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, help, help us to understand how much you are working on our behalf uh, sometimes you do seem distant. We don't know what you're doing or if you're doing anything at all. But you're trying to tell us in your word, Father, that you, you never stop working on our behalf. And so we thank you for that. And, and Father, help us to cooperate and participate in that. Help us to do our part that your will may be done in us and through us. You've done so much for us, Jesus, that... We want to give something back to you. We want to offer our lives to you. And may they be lives that give you glory, that please you, that when you think of us, when you see us, it brings joy to you, Father. We want to bring you joy. And Father, for the parts of our life that don't do that right now, that are off track, that are selfish, that are not expressions of love to you for all you've done for us, would you help us to correct them? We're sorry for that, Father. We've done selfish things. We didn't think about you. I didn't. I just thought about what I wanted. And I, I regret that. And I'm sorry for that. Father, help us to live better lives, lives that comply with what you've called us to. We just give you all the glory, Father, and all the honor. And we thank you again. Praying all this in Jesus' name. Amen.